All right, good morning, or actually good afternoon. I'm jet lagged. It's morning where I'm supposed to be sleeping. <laughs> My name is Melissa Wertheimer. I'm a senior music reference specialist at the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., in the United States. And I would love to welcome you to pre-conference workshop number three, Crafting Appraisal Strategies for the Curation of Web Archives. I first want to acknowledge the original co-authors of the first version, the first shorter version of this workshop, Megan Lyon from the Library of Congress and Tori Macius from the University of San Diego in California. Um, they co-presented with me at uh, DigiPres in Baltimore, Maryland in 2022. This is a longer and deeper version of that, and I thank them for being so gracious to encourage me to take this on the road and run with it. So thank you, Tori and Megan. So today's agenda. For an introduction, we're just going to start with a quick temperature check of your web archiving experience. And then we will have a brief section on some theory. Make sure that we're all using the same words to talk about the same things. That's the beautiful part about us being from all over the world. Then we will take that theory and bring it to practice in the next section. The workshop portion will be the longest part of this afternoon. We will work with a sample thematic web archive, and we will work with a sample event-based web archive. And we will have questions and wrap up both um, at the end of each of those web archive applications and at the very end as well. So at the bottom is a link to the Google Drive folder with materials for the workshop. If you have not already done so, uh, please take a look. Um, the slides are there if you want to follow along in case uh, it sounds like I'm talking a little bit quickly. There are also the sample seed lists if you did not bring your own. You can use your own, as I said in the email last week. And then also there are some supplementary documents that I welcome you to look at in your own time, such as uh, sample collection development policies, a suggested reading list, and, um, and others. So now for the temperature check. I just want to get a feel for who's in the room. We're not judging anybody. I'm not judging you. This is just so we can know who we're here with today. So by a show of hands, who has curated a web archive collection or contributed to a seed list? Excellent. Who has written collection development policies for or including web archives? Okay, slightly fewer, but still the majority of people in the room. Excellent. Who has studied archival appraisal theories and methods in school? Okay, we're starting to dwindle. This is where it gets interesting. Good, good, good. And who has applied archival appraisal theories and methods to analog materials, whether it's photographs, sheet music, rare books? Okay, great. Who has applied archival appraisal theories and methods to born digital materials, not just web archives? Okay, I love that this is getting smaller. It's getting warmer in here, everybody. All right, and who has asked whether web archiving is the best way to document a particular event or subject? Yes, great, thank you. So I hope that gives us all a better idea of who we're all in the room with, and what we can all learn from each other today. So terminology and strategies applied to web archiving. So to make sure that everyone is on the same page, I'll now just give a brief presentation on concepts that we will use for appraisal. These will center American and Canadian archival theories, and some terms may be ones you already know and use, some may be entirely new, and others you may define differently in your local professional practices. That's perfectly okay. So for starters, here's what I want you to think about. Collections are what we build and curate, and they're each summarized by a collection scope. Appraisal is the process of how and why we collect those items or group of items, not the collection scope. And then collection development policies are the high-level guidance that govern both the collections and the appraisal. So just tuck that back here, and we'll get back to that. 
So what is appraisal? There are multiple definitions of appraisal in the Society of American Archivists Dictionary of Archives terminology. The one that applies to us today is the process of identifying materials offered to an archives that have sufficient value to be accessioned. So how, how does this apply to web archives? The process of identifying materials. Appraisal is an iterative selection process that happens across the life cycle of any object, whether it's paper or born digital. Also, sufficient value. How do we define this for each repository, web archive collection, and individual website? And that's what we'll dig into in the workshop. So why do we participate in this process of appraisal? We appraise archives to have consistent collection development criteria. Appraisal is inevitably a subjective act, and it's important to have consistent steps and thought processes so that we can contribute as equitably as we can to the historical record while respecting our repository's collection development policies. And we might find out that we also have to change them. We participate in appraisal to create long-term documentation about the collections that we steward in the event of deaccessions, transfers, and policy changes. Documentation of appraisal actions helps us to understand why a collection was created in the first place. How many of you had said, why is this here? Yeah, I'm hearing the chuckles. We've all been there. So why is this here? Do these crawls need to be ongoing, stopped? or adjusted, and if scopes and appraisal criteria also need to be adjusted to meet our current needs. We also participate for transparency and accountability to internal and external stakeholders. There are core ethical values of the archives profession, and they are format neutral. We can be held accountable for our decisions with documentation. We also participate in appraisal for continuity between staff and teams. People retire, people leave, new people come on board, grant funds go away. So appraisal documentation helps to keep everyone on the same page over time. And finally, we do it for responsible stewardship, which includes space, both shelves and servers, and resources, which are people, funding, and time. This is another core ethical value of the archives profession. Can we truly take on the long-term digital preservation actions of our web archives without a sufficient budget for data, storage, product subscription, staff, and local duplication? Now, I would be remiss if I did not mention that there has been much discussion in the past decades archival literature about the power inherent in the appraisal process, let alone the power that archivists hold to shape history. Power is a human construct, appraisal is a human set of actions and thereby subjective and imperfect, and all of this labor can be invisible. So now for a small sample of the kind of archival values and appraisal strategies we're talking about. I'll start with what may be the most familiar to everyone at this conference, technical appraisal. The Society of American Archivists defines technical appraisal as the process of identifying technological characteristics and needs of archival records to determine whether the records can be preserved by the archives. In other words, is it feasible to preserve and provide access to this content? This is often the very first step to web archiving, take all of our social media conversations. That's technical appraisal. So these questions during technical appraisal may be ones you already ask each day, and now you can apply a term to them. So for example, does the, crawl, does the crawler require specific scoping instructions? Is it a website or is it an interface for a data set? Is there dynamic or streaming media? Is the website platform difficult to capture and replay? Does the content require human interaction? Is it social media or an app? And can the desired content be captured with available crawl frequencies? Here's another term that may be familiar to many of you already, informational value. 
The Society of American Archivists defines informational value as the usefulness or significance of materials based on their content, independent of any intrinsic or evidential value. So focus on the beginning of that, the usefulness or significance of materials based on their content. We'll get to the other terms in a minute. So in other words, how substantial is this content? For web archives, determining informational value may include asking how deep is the directory? Are there files to download? Are important parts of the website only accessible with a password? Intrinsic value, here is the term within the definition of informational value. The SAA dictionary defines this as the usefulness or significance of a record derived from its physical or associational qualities inherent in its original form and generally independent of its content that are integral to its material nature and would be lost in reproduction. It's a very long sentence, a lot of layers applicable to web archiving, however, so let's take a look. So these layers reveal great questions for archives. Is the creator of this website significant enough to the collection that their website should be archived regardless of how complete or good the information is? Is there intrinsic value in the source code? For example, are we looking at an example of the vintage web fast going away? Also, is the HTML version of the website better to archive than the PDF on the website that contains all of the information? I asked myself this all the time with the Library of Congress Coronavirus Web Archive when we encountered policy websites. There would always be a PDF to download on a policy website that duplicated the HTML. It was just easier to do the PDF. Evidential value, this is the second term mentioned in the definition of informational value. So there are two definitions in the SAA dictionary. The first applies to our purposes today, the second applies to law. So the definition we will use is the usefulness of records that provides information about the origins, functions, and activities of their creators. So for web archives, you might ask, if the website contains proof of the activities of a creator, a community, a movement, a group, does the website document a specific event, a policy, a course of action, or a response to any of those? And is there evidence of ongoing activity as evidenced by frequent updates to the site? Now, authenticity and uniqueness are values of archival records, and they relate to each other because they both talk about creators. So authenticity is defined as the quality of being genuine, not a counterfeit, and free from tampering, and is typically inferred from internal and external evidence, including its physical characteristics, structure, content, and context. Another helpful mouthful. <laughs> And uniqueness doesn't have its own definition in the SAA dictionary, but it is addressed within the entry for archival nature, which is why that definition is up here. And this addresses context of creation. And the origins of this concept are actually European. They're not American or Canadian. So how can authenticity and uniqueness apply to web archives? You can ask, is this the best place to capture the information? Is it the original source? And if not, is the original source available? Does my repository already have similar content? And if so, do we really need more of it? So now we need to use these archival values to appraise and curate our web archives and document how we used them. So remember what I asked you to think about in the beginning. Let's review. Collections are what we build and curate, each summarized by a collection scope. Appraisal is the process of how and why we collect specific terms or groups of items. And collection development policies are high-level guidance that govern both. So let's visualize this as a nested hierarchy, from the lightest purple to the darkest. Repositories have collection development policies. 
Collection development policies guide what gets collected and excluded. The appraisal process determines an individual collection's contents, therefore its scope. Appraisal documentation serves as your internal record of this process for transparency and responsible stewardship. So what are some of the ways we can create this documentation of our appraisal processes for web archive collections? One idea that I've used is to create a rubric of archival values, like the ones that we just defined. Then I select websites above a score threshold. And this can help make granular decisions better documented and more transparent, as well as help a team use consistent criteria and keep within data budget limits. You can customize the rubric based on your collection. And I talk specifically about this rubric in uh, the 2022 IIPC online uh, conference. So we will use a sample rubric in the workshop portion to appraise an event-based web archive. Here's another idea. Because crawl frequency can be considered as part of technical appraisal, you can create a chart that assigns crawl frequencies for specific types of websites. For example, when I built the Library of Congress Commission Composers web archive, I found that living composers had websites that needed to be appraised differently than those of deceased composers. To make my work more streamlined, I created this exact chart. It also serves as ready reference as I continue to build the collection, as well as documentation for future staff about why I made certain selections and decisions. Another type of appraisal documentation strategy is to use a decision tree to keep your processes consistent. This is a hypothetical decision tree for a blog collection. We'll use a more detailed one in the workshop to appraise a thematic collection. And another way to plan your collection and document your appraisal decisions is writing brief narratives relating individual URLs or types of content to each other to the collection as a whole, and to other collections you have. You can even focus on certain creators or dates of creation. An example is a document you will reference later during the event-based collection appraisal exercise. OK, so now for the moment you've all been waiting for, applying theory to practice, and the moment I've been waiting for, water. So we'll first apply a decision tree based on intrinsic value to a thematic web archive, followed by a few reflection questions. And I hope all of you take up the microphone that's going to get passed around and contribute to that discussion. And then we'll use a rubric to appraise seeds for an event-based collection. Please note that web archives related to records management or mandatory deposit are out of the scope of this workshop. So if you don't get to everything on the sample seed lists or the ones that you brought, that's perfectly okay. Remember, these exercises are about applying consistent appraisal criteria across a collection. So one more time, if you haven't already, here's your URL. Go to the Google Drive link folder so that you can access the workshop materials, as well as the supplementary documents for your future reference. OK, so we're going to start with a thematic web archive. Um, does everyone, is everyone basically set with the uh, Google Drive stuff? Nods, yes, yes, OK. So before we jump into this, again, let's just define our terms. Let's define what we mean. Thematic web archives are curated around shared subjects, topics, and creators. These don't necessarily have to have a definite end date to crawls, but they can, depending on the topic. So a special consideration is another archival value, interrelatedness. And this is also actually defined by the Society of American Archivists as another component of archival nature. So questions in this area can be related to your current holdings in your archive special collections and general collections. And yes, web archiving can be a mode of acquisition for open access serials for your general collections, not necessarily your archives. Um, you can think about other items in the same web archive collection. 
do hierarchies like chapters of national organizations or artists who studied under other artists exist? How can you represent those? You can also ask about existing web archive collections. Do any of the websites you're thinking about fit into multiple collection scopes? Do the websites inform or contextualize websites in other collections? And are these URLs already being crawled? OK, so here we go. Here's our appraisal exercise for the thematic web archive. We're going to spend about 15 minutes. Um, this is choose your own adventure. So the option one people are using the materials in the Google Drive folder. The option two people are those of you who brought materials from your own institution. So step one, select your seed list. Either sample thematic web archive seed list from Google Drive or the one that you brought. Are, are we set with what we've selected, whether one we brought or one we downloaded? I just want to see a few more nods before I go on. OK, I hate moving too fast. All right, we're ready for step two. Step two, you're going to review the proposed collection scope. If you're using the sample thematic web archive seed list from Google Drive, um, there's a document um, the, that says scope and decision tree, um, and you're going to review that proposed scope. Option two, review the proposed collection scope of the seed list that you brought with you. After you review your proposed collection scope, you're going to appraise the seeds of your selected seed list with the decision tree. So if you're using what's in Google Drive, you're going to use the decision tree that's in the document, or you can also get a closer look just by looking at the PNG file, sample thematic web archive decision tree and you're going to document your results. Just take some notes. And option two, make sure you download that PNG file from Google Drive. And then you're going to create your own first step with a yes or no response about the intrinsic value of your creators. Then you're going to follow the tree as, as planned and document your results. So just so I know, how many people brought their own, their own seed list? OK, great. So for those of you, remember, you do need to download this PNG file just so you can follow the tree. Just change the very first step, making it a yes or no question about your creator. All right. Good luck. All right, we're going to start bringing it back. Like I said, it's perfectly OK. I purposely gave you way too many URLs in case there was some whiz in the room. So it's OK. So um, time is up for now. You can always go back to this on your own, by the way, and, and tell me how it went uh, through email. I'd love to hear. So how many of you, with, with what you were able to look at, how many of you created a smaller collection than you anticipated? OK. How many of you created a larger collection than you anticipated? OK. And how many of you just don't have enough to tell right now? OK. <laughs> totally fair. Totally fair. So one of the things about the decision tree, um, with even just talking with one attendee while everybody was working, was the amount of human time and detail it took to do this work and think about, well, how do I figure out what the directory is? and how deep it is, how do I tell if it's been updated recently, all the little details that you need to look for when you're analyzing, right? So a machine can't do that. You do that. You do the appraisal. Yes, you're the human, right? We love the machines. For right now, they're not going to replace us. They can, they can do many other things that we absolutely need them for, but this is something that you do, OK? So event-based web archive collections. Quick review, these are collections that, be, that can be created for events ranging from elections to national disasters to pandemics. pandemics. So since you need to collect in the moment before the content changes or disappears from the live web, thoughtful curation and early planning are important and not always possible. Sometimes it's very reactionary, right? How many of you have felt when you're uh, working on an event-based web archive that you're constantly chasing and playing catch-up. 
yeah, sometimes it's a little like, ah, oh my God, this seems like it's going to go away tomorrow. And they sometimes do. So with that in mind, there are some special considerations for event-based collecting. So is there a logical endpoint for your crawls? For example, um, I don't know how many of you were in um, the collection development groups meeting earlier, but they were talking about um, the IIPC's um, Olympics and Paralympics web archive. That's an event-based collection that has a definitive endpoint because the Olympics don't go on indefinitely. There's a very definite endpoint. And they have made a decision that they're going to end their crawls two weeks later after the Olympics, and then it's done. So that's an event-based web archive where they say, this is when we're done. COVID pandemic, I'm sure a lot of us participated in collections that are still ongoing. Some of them went on a lot longer than we thought and just had to stop because of any kind of institutional or personal reasons. So it really depends on the event. Um, also, is web archiving the best way to document this event? This is the question that everyone hates. There are lots of people who think web archiving is the best way to document everything. And I'm here just to say, think about it. Based on the content that you see, is web archiving the best way to document this event? It may not always be, and we may not like that answer. But it's an important one if you're coming from an archival appraisal standpoint. If you're not, that's fine. But from archival appraisal, you have to ask, is this the best way to do justice for this content and these creators? Because that's who it's about. It's not about you. It's about the creators. So if this event is only happening on social media and you do your technical appraisal and you go, oh no, and you can't get it, that means web archiving may not be the best way to document your event. So then you talk to your colleagues and say, hey, hey, archivist friends on the other side of the building, can we reach out to these creators and ask them to download their feed and donate it to us as a born digital file and then we preserve it that way because we're having a lot of trouble getting it on web archiving? Then you're still documenting the event that took place on social media through another born digital means, right? Also. Maybe sometimes oral histories are another way. I know I'm sounding very conservative and I don't want to give the impression that that's who I am as an archivist, but it's just about thinking about with the effort of the people doing the work and the limited funds that we have and server space isn't always infinite. It may be cheap, but it's not infinite. And also not every institution has equal resources. How can we best serve the creators and the people that are liaising with them, the people that you employ, you? Um, ethics of care. This is an important one, especially this, this came up a lot with, with COVID. How much exposure to traumatic content can you and your employees really go through? There was a point where I was just thinking, breathing COVID websites. I would be reading the, the, all kinds of newspapers on my phone at 2 a.m. and say, oh, they mentioned an organization. Do they have a website? Great. Let me forward this to myself at work so that I know to web archive it tomorrow. Oh my God, that's so unhealthy. So how much of that can you go through truly, right? That's ethics of care. Also, think externally. How will your act of collecting and notifying harmful creators and misinformation give a false impression of support? Everyone has different permissions policies in this room. Some people in this room, and please raise your hand, how many of you um, do just a notification, hey, we're crawling your website, opt out if you want? Okay, so you just do a, not a notification opt out model. How many of people here ask permission based on copyright laws? Okay, so that was another thing that came up, especially during COVID. All of these misinformation creators, at my institution, we have to ask permission if it's creative content. Well, there are certain organizations where as the National Library, it would be very, very harmful to make them think that what they're saying is valid. So then that's an ethical consideration to think about. And then also thinking about the event perspectives of your website creators. Is the event impacting certain communities more than others? And 
are those the voices that are being represented? Or is it an outside community who's reporting on that community? Think about all of the, and again, I'm using an American example because that is, that is where I come from. Think about all of the awful, awful violence against people of color in the United States and all of the violence that is done to them. We have had so many individuals killed by law enforcement. And if, we're, and if you only web archive the white press, then where are you gonna be getting the voices of the people of color who are harmed? That's what I'm asking you to think about. So it could be a little heavy, I promise, but here we go. So we're back with Choose Your Own Adventure. If you hated choosing your own adventure, feel free to download the, C, the uh, samples from the Google Drive folder. Now for this one, um, what you're doing is a second pass, and that often happens with appraisal, especially with analog and hybrid collections that are not web archives necessarily. So for this situation, you're presented with an event, documenting an event, and you had colleagues that already did a first pass with a narrative. So you're gonna have the narrative when you download it. And now, you're um, now tasked with refining the collection by other means, that the narrative was great, but you now still have too many seeds for your data budget for this collection, and it has to be refined. So you choose a rubric to address contents at the seed level, okay? So the sample event-based web archive rubric spreadsheet is in there, and um, please note that these are all Wayback URLs, so just pretend that they're real URLs. This is an, an event that happened a long time ago about an earthquake in California and Mexico. So these are older URLs that are now only accessible through the Wayback Machine, but pretend, pretend that they're real. So then, um, again, step two, you're gonna review the proposed collection scope and the narrative. And then step three, you're going to appraise the seeds with the rubric. Now, to use the rubric, you're going to fill in the numerical value, one to three, for each seed URL. It's very consistent. One is low, two is medium, three is high. And you're going to make the note of the average score at the end. So you're going to have a total column. And then however many you get done, just make a note of the average. Take a look at your highest score. Take a look at your lowest score. Um, and then if you are choosing your own seeds, download um, the rubric and just replace the URLs with your own and you can run them through the same rubric. Does that make sense? Cool. All right, everybody, go on your adventure. All right, let's take a little pause here. Um, for however far you've gotten, and there's way more content there than I expect anyone to go through. Um, just make sure that you quickly um, use a function to make note of the average score of however many in your final uh, total column. So make sure you know your average, your highest score, and your lowest score. Okay, so how many of you for your average score that it was mostly ones? Okay. How many of you for your average score, it was mostly twos? Okay, average score, mostly threes. Okay, so mostly everything was the average score was three. So with that in mind, if your average score was three, um, did anybody have a low score of one anywhere? Anybody have any ones at all? Great, good. Okay, that's fair, <laughs> that's fair. Um, all right, so if we're all, let's just say, well, given that our assignment was to refine the, the number of seeds we're collecting because we have a very strict data limit and the narrative made everything too wide and our average score was three, we're gonna tell our powers that be, okay, well, to address your concerns, we're only going to collect everything in this rubric that had a three. So now with that in mind, only calculate the number 
of seeds that you rated a three with the total final score? And with that, I want to know how many of you then, only looking at three as the final score, have a smaller collection than you anticipated? A couple of you, okay. And how many of you have a larger collection than you anticipated? How many of you don't have a collection? <laughs> okay, so I wanna thank you all so much for being open for sharing thoughts and for allowing me to be the devil's advocate and challenge you all and um, be, be in the ring with you a little bit. Curating collections is hard work. And so that's why I'm ending with one of my favorite web comics of all time about my access to resources on blank subject over time. And I just always laugh when I see the part about the back end database not available on archive.org. Um, so I do hope you have a great rest of your conference. And I would absolutely love for you to reach out to me with your thoughts about this workshop. It's still in progress. So if you have comments about how it went, I would love to know them, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, I'd especially like to know if you end up taking any of these ideas and transforming them or using them verbatim with your own collections. I'd love to know how you all use these ideas. Basically, today, I just wanted to plant some seeds <laughs> and <laughs> I wanted to plant some seeds in your minds, get dialogue talking, get your wheels turning, and, and maybe have some conversations at this conference that haven't ha been had before. So thank you so much for your time and your expertise. Have a great rest of the conference. Thank you.